Um, well, yes, um, first of all, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. I'm Sandra, and um, what I want to talk about today is um, um, large-scale coordination and networks. And after a short preamble, I'm going to focus on a paper that I published uh, recently with a team of physicists uh, slash computer scientists that I think will help me put on the table a few topics for discussion that I think fit well the theme um, of this meeting. Now, I'm a sociologist by training. All my degrees are in sociology. But I work in a communication school. And that is not a coincidence. Um, um, I think it's pretty obvious that communication Technologies mediate today most dimensions of social life. And so I think that if we want to untangle the logic of social life, and this is what we sociologists like doing, then we need to understand the logic of communication and the dynamics that communication triggers. And so uh, my work so far has focused mostly on the emergence of coordination in decentralized networks. And you have two pictures here. One is about fireflies flashing beautifully at the same time. The other is about protesters in Hong Kong during the so-called Umbrella Revolution, which took place in 2014. As you all know, fireflies and protesters are um, very different types of living creatures, but they share one thing, and that is the ability to coordinate in a decentralized way. And that is determined to a great extent by communication networks. In the case of protesters, um, social media seem to have played an instrumental role in um, helping them coordinate their actions. And yes, there has been a lot of shallow commentary on the value of Twitter revolutions. But to me, one obvious piece of evidence um, suggesting that social media is important are all the attempts by governments around the world to control information flow in those platforms in the form of censorship um, or direct pruning, as in arresting people. And so a lot of my work tries to find out in what sense social media and more generally the centralized communication networks mediate the process of large-scale coordination. And again, the paper that I want to discuss today is an attempt to do that using Twitter data. However, as a sociologist with a weakness for history, I can't help but take us back a couple of centuries so that we can revisit an earlier communication revolution to the one that we have today. And that was the revolution triggered by the invention of the telegraph, which commentators of the time called the wonder of the age, and which more recently has been referred to as the Victorian internet. And the reason is because the reactions to the telegraph were not that different from our reactions to digital uh, technologies today. One thing that surprises me when looking at these historical accounts is that we use the same metaphors, or the same mental maps, as you call them, um, to talk about these communication technologies. Now, two centuries before IBM talked about the Internet of Things as the nervous system of the planetary body, engineers referred to the telegraph as the nervous system of the commercial system. And so in both instances, um, the analogy pushes you um, to think that if there is a nervous system, then surely we need a brain processing all that information in a centralized way. And I'm not sure that that is necessarily the best way to think about it. In any case, the invention of the telegraph was part of bigger social transformations, amongst them the reconfiguration of knowledge so that universities could start giving space to emerging sciences like engineering but also sociology. And I think that perhaps today we are in a similar crossroads as back then in terms of redefining those boundaries. And so in the history of social thought, there is this big debate that took place at the end of the 19th century between two of the founders of sociological thinking, Emil Durkheim and Gabriel Tart. The sociologists uh, in the room will recognize these. For the non-sociologists, take this as a crash course on social thought, and I promise I'll be brief. So essentially, the reason why these two gentlemen disagreed uh, was because they had very different answers to uh, a seemingly simple question, and that is, what are social facts? Now, the answer to this question was uh, very important because it was to define the boundaries of this emerging discipline called sociology. And so the answer that Darkheim gave, gave was social facts are social structures. So um, all those group divisions that transcend specific individuals, right? So when you think about ethnicity, when you think about social class, these are the important explanatory factors that Darkheim had in mind when talking about social facts. Now, the answer that Tart gave to this question was very different. 
Um, for him, the elemental social fact was imitation, which is a term that he used to talk about contagion and social influence as channeled by communication. And so for him, communication was the quintessential social fact and the main driver of social change. According to all accounts, Durkheim won this debate, but this wasn't necessarily because he had the best ideas. He had received the support of the university system, which uh, created the first sociology chair for him, while Tart was still an outsider. And he was also cleverly exploiting the best data that was available at the time, which was essentially census data. Tart, on the other hand, was interested in things that couldn't be unambiguously measured back then, but which he thought were becoming increasingly important due to the expansion of communication technologies like the telegraph. And so it was Todd's ideas that were transported across the Atlantic to start the line of research known as collective behavior, which is where my interest in coordination would fit. This is a very brief historical timeline of this branch of research that sociologists like Eliu Katz define as dynamics that break away from social structures such as class, ethnicity, or bureaucracy, which are the sort of things that many sociologists are interested in, but not me or not uh, in the first instance. And so the subject matter for this line of work included things as diverse as crowds, fads, fashion, rumors, opinion formation, social unrest, and social movements. There was one common denominator for all these authors, and that was their emphasis on the importance of interdependence um, and what they call social contagion, again following a common metaphor in the 18th and the 19th centuries uh, when societies were compared to living organisms which is, by the way, the same metaphor that the IBMs of the world use today when they talk about global brains and planetary nervous systems. In any case, and I'm getting closer to the point that I want to make, um, those following this line of research were constantly struggling with the lack of appropriate data, right? The closest start ever got to measuring his ideas on social contagion was when he fantasized about comp compiling statistics of conversation, as he called it. He wrote, much in the same way in which we can measure the walking speed of pedestrians in various capitals of the world, so we could try to measure the speed of conversation in each city as well. And this matter, because talking was, in his scheme of things, one of the main ways in which ideas get transmitted from person to person. And so, you know, the more conversations you have, the more opportunities uh, for contagion. However, he concluded, the elements for the moment are lacking, by which he meant that uh, that sort of data uh, were still not available. Um, later, in the 50s, some sociologists wrote, collective behavior is not yet an area in which generalizations can be presented in precise form and with the backing of experimental or quantitative evidence. And in the 60s, some other sociologists wrote, because of their magnitude and complexity, collective phenomena are not directly amenable to observation under the kind of rigorously controlled conditions most sociologists would choose. They also pointed out that collective behavior is by definition spontaneous and unpredictable, and so that was the main reason they argued why it is so difficult to analyze. And then in the 70s, things start changing a little with the first mathematical models that at least offered the possibility of conducting more sophisticated thought experiments, but again, those developments were limited by the fact that they could not be validated with empirical data. And this is what digital technologies, as Duncan was saying this morning, and a few of us, uh, most of you know, <laughs> this is what digital technologies have changed. All right, so to summarize, digital technologies have made uh, measurable what back in the 19th century was uh, so difficult to grasp, which is essentially, I would argue, uh, is the main reason why Tart lost his debate and they have placed the analysis of spontaneous and unstructured social action back at the heart of research, helping us overcome many of the difficulties encountered by sociologists decades ago. The difference, and this is an important difference, is that insights are now coming um, not just from the social sciences with their historical boundaries, but from the many attempts to analyze the new available evidence with a multidisciplinary mindset. And I think that all of us here know what that means, and I think that we all agree that this is a good, it's, it's a good thing to encourage, that way of thinking. Um, the way I see it, there are three main areas of work that define the field of collective behavior today. The first is the study of aggregated patterns of collective attention with a focus on temporal dynamics. 
The second refers to the analysis of networks of information flow with a focus on the structural properties of those networks. And the third refers to the individual level mechanisms that make those other higher level dynamics emerge. And many of us in this room have worked in one way or another in these three dimensions. <coughs> the one that I want to focus on today is this, um, aggregated patterns of collective attention, because I think that they reveal interesting things about large-scale coordination. Okay, and so this is the paper that I want to discuss. It was published earlier this month, and this is the dream team of physicists um, who are each unique in their background, but they all share an interest in networks and social systems. In spite of the somehow cryptic title, and I really tried to change it, but they didn't let me, all we try to do in this paper is determine who leads and who follows in communication networks when massive collective events take place, and that includes protests and political mobilizations. And so following the problem-solving spirit of which Duncan was talking this morning, there are two problems we dealt with in this paper. One we could solve, and the other we couldn't. Although we already knew when we started this that we wouldn't be able to solve it, and yet somehow we still have hopes that we will be able to do it at some point. The problem we could solve relates to finding the appropriate temporal scale to analyze communication dynamics. This uh, question derives from increasing empirical evidence suggesting that human communication doesn't follow the patterns depicted in panel A, meaning the rate at which information is being exchanged is not constant over time, but instead it exhibits this sort of bursty profile of panel B. There are periods of intense communication activity and periods uh, where nothing seems to happen. And this goes beyond the usual circadian cycles, right? And, and communication collected around political protests and social mobilization certainly um, follows the second pattern. And so the question here, and this matters obviously because if uh, communication channels social influence, what this means is that influence will be more intense at specific periods of time, and it's not necessarily easy a priori to determine when that will happen. Um, and so the question here is, how do we adjust our lenses uh, when examining this dynamic so that we capture the intrinsic rhythm of communication and so that we can zoom in when we need to uh, and we can zoom out when we have to? Now, the question we couldn't answer um, is whether changes in the characteristic temporal scale can help us predict collective events like massive mobilizations or trending topics before they are trending. And the idea here is that we could, in principle, use this metric of how fast or how slowly information is being exchanged online as we would use voice in the sea, namely as a mechanism to determine when the waters are rising before the tsunami strikes. Um, and this picture on the screen is a kinetic sculpture by David Bowen that I saw once that moves by drawing real-time information from a buoy that is uh, hidden in some spot in the ocean. And I thought it was pretty awesome, but it was like a window to this part of the world that we will never see um, physically. But anyway, the methodology that we introduce in this paper, which um, I'm going to explain to you in a minute, gives us a metric that in principle we could use uh, for this, but that in practice only works with the benefit of hindsight. Because you need to know which tweets to look for, essentially, um, and when you don't know when you're, what you're looking for, the method doesn't work. Uh, and so let me tell you a little bit more about the method. So this figure here is a schematic summary of the steps involved in our methodology. The first thing we do is to use a geographical partition to reconstruct the time series tracking activity patterns in Twitter. So that will be panel A. This time series contains information about the role that each geographic area plays in shaping overall um, communication dynamics. And so in this example, the geographic areas correspond to entire countries, but we could also aggregate the information on a lower resolution level for instance, cities, and in fact, for most of the data that we analyze, we use the level of uh, metropolitan regions. Um, um, or for conceptually different partitions, for instance, social demographic groups. Whatever the partition used, what the technique tries to do is determine who leads and who follows in the exchange of information. That is, whether activity in one region helps predict activity in another region. 
And so what the technique does is to first transform the time series into a shorter sequence of symbols that simplifies the complexity of the original signals. And that would be depicted in panel B. You should think of this sequence of symbols as a sort of DNA encoding the profile of communication dynamics um, that we can then use to find patterns of directional influence. And the goal here is very similar to that of Granger causality, but the symbolic transformation is important in this context because it helps us control for the amplitude of each time series and it eliminates the impact that more densely populated regions have on overall volume. You know, like more social media users, trivially lead to more messages and higher spikes. And so by transforming spiky and non-stationary series into a sequence of symbols that only map the ups and downs uh, of the trends, so to speak, and not the magnitude, the method eliminates noise and helps identify more clearly the driving dynamics across regions. And so these driving dynamics can then be represented as a network mapping the influence that each region has over the other regions. And so. When a time series helps predict another time series, it means that there is a transfer of information from the first geographic region to the second. In other words, that the second region is following the first. And so essentially what the method um, helps answer is the question of whether some regions, um, whether there are some regions that lead the way when it comes to drawing attention to some issues. All right, but now, this is where we enter the domain of the first problem that I mentioned, and that is how to find the right scale to build a time series. And by this I mean that if you use a wider aggregation span, say if you pull together activity over a month instead of say a, a day, that will result in fewer data points and smoother trends. And if you use narrower spans, then the series will have more points but spikier and noisier signals. And that's what Panel C aims to illustrate. And so the question here is, which temporal resolution do we use to aggregate the data? Let me say here that the, as, as a sociologist, the problem of scale is a sort of question that wasn't even in the radar for my social research before digital data became overwhelmingly available. Most communication activity today can be obtained with a temporal resolution that goes down to the second. So the question is, again, how much do we need to adjust our zoom lenses, if these were a camera, to capture the action as it unfolds? And what this means is that we have to find a way of aggregating temporal data so that we can reveal significant patterns. In our case, who's leading a process of collective upheaval and who's following to make it grow. And this is what we make use of a data-driven solution, which is essentially possible because of the computational tools that we have now at our disposal and also because of the magic of my colleague, Javier Borges, who did all the computations. But so the solution entails the following. For a given sliding window, consider all possible pairs of geographical units, in this example countries, and compute the total amount of information being transferred between them for different aggregation spans, say a minute, an hour, a day. The amount of information transferred, as calculated by this symbolic transfer entropy um, measure that gives title um, to the paper, that is the metric that serves as a proxy, or that we use as a proxy, for leader follower dynamics, right? So the higher the total transfer of information amongst regions, that is, the stronger the ties in the network depicted in panel B, the more leading following trends are revealed by the data. And so this metric, which is the one that we use, although there's probably other metrics that could be used for the same purpose, changes depending on how we aggregate the time series. So if we use different aggregation rules, we can then compare how the metric varies for each of those rules and then select the aggregation span that maximizes uh, information flow. And this is, we argue, and uh, I guess this is the main argument that we make in the paper, this is the temporal scale that best captures the intrinsic rhythm of the centralized communication, the aggregation span that maximizes information flow across regions. And so what the method unveils, and I'm going to show you some of the empirical data in a minute, is that this rhythm is not constant. It progressively gets smaller as the onset of massive collective events. For instance, a social mobilization uh, um, gets closer, right? And so that would be captured uh, by PANA DA. However, this is only the case when the momentum is built up endogenously from the bottom up. In cases where what we call collective effervescence to honor Darkheim, 
when those moments of collective effervescence result from mass media interventions, so that would be like an exogenous shock in the form of breaking news, then the characteristic temporal scale remains stable until the news break in, which brings it suddenly down by accelerating interest and the pace at which communication flows. And this is a scenario that we try to depict in panel DB. And so overall, the method shows that the temporal scale of communication decreases systematically as the levels of global and internal coordination increase. That is, as the different time series start synchronizing with each other, and what this means is that social influence ends up aligning all the time series to the same tempo, which in turn means that all regions are sort of boiling at the same time and it's not possible to identify leaders or followers so clearly anymore. And again, this built up process is not visible when an external force, say mass media, suddenly drives collective attention to the boiling point. If we represent the network of influence across regions as a matrix encoding the correlation strength for each pair, that would be panel E, what we see is that communication dynamics transition from a hierarchical structure where a few regions dominate the flow to a horizontal structure where all regions are driving each other. So this is the method, and there is a 30-page long supplementary material document um, in the, to the paper where you can check all the details because obviously there's a lot of parameters that you can adjust here. And I already anticipated, so if you're welcome to check it out if you're so inclined, but um, so, and I already anticipated the main conclusions that we drew from these, but now I'm gonna show you what the, some of the data actually looks like. And we analyzed five data sets in the paper. I'm gonna show you only data about three. These are three of the five data sets that we analyzed. The first two correspond to um, political mobilizations. So there would be examples of the sort of collective dynamics that sociologists have been interested in analyzing for over a century. And then the third figure corresponds to the announcement of the acquisition of Motorola by Google, which sort of came by surprise and, and people couldn't anticipate it. And it's a data set that we use as a comparison benchmark to the more endogenously driven data sets that relate to political protest. And we obtained this time series by sampling Twitter, looking for messages that contain relevant hashtags, which is why, as I mentioned before, the method only applies with the benefit of hindsight. And so if we could find a way of identifying relevant hashtags before they become relevant, that's when this tool could be used to try to anticipate events, but we haven't found a way of doing that yet. And so what the blue line captures here are changes in the characteristic temporal scale, which as I said before, we define in terms of maximizing information flow, and the red line tracks volume for reference. Um, the red vertical bars correspond to the onset of the main social events, so these would be protests or the sudden announcement of the acquisition, uh, and the gray bar in the case of the Brazilian data set um, refers to a smaller protest that was organized before the big one. And so what you can see is that there is a difference between the first two panels and the third. In the first two, the temporal scale that maximizes uh, information flow, which in this case it is expressed in minutes, goes down as we approach the mobilization day. In the third data set, it remains constant until the big media announcement is made. And so again, one of the important things that we show in the paper, which is also sort of subtle, is that this decrease in the temporal scale does not result from increases in volume, that would be trivial, but from increasing levels of coordination across all time series. And this is something that you can see more clearly when you look at the matrices that encode pairwise correlations. And so here what we have on the vertical axis is a measure that we use to summarize how hierarchical or horizontal those networks of influence are as time goes by. We reorder the matrices so that geographical areas are ranked according to the number of times that they are dominant over the rest of the areas. And then we take the ratio between the sums um, of the matrix elements in the lower and upper triangles. And so essentially this measure quantifies the state of the system along the continuum that goes from hierarchical to decentralized communication. And the way in which this parameter works is that as it gets closer to one, the network is more horizontal or more disorder. Um, and so that means that there are more regions that are driving other regions. And what you can see in the figure is that communication becomes progressively decentralized in the case of the protests but there is no evidence of such gradual progression in the case of the acquisition data, although after the announcement, um, you also see an increase in overall uh, driving dynamics. 
And what the matrices do essentially is to zoom into specific data points in this progression so that you can actually see what the networks of influence look like at two points before and after the collective events. So what are the main takeaways of this research? Well, first, we show evidence that the emergence of collective phenomena can be characterized by a double transition, a transition in the time scales from slow to fast, and a transition in the patterns of directional influence from hierarchical to horizontal. And these two things are related, right? We also show that decreasing time scales are a proxy to increasing levels of internal coordination. Again, the decrease does not result from higher volumes of communication, which intuitively, but also trivially, go up as collective events like a protest gets closer. But from the increasingly higher synchronization of all the time series, which, starts, uh, which start beating uh, um, with the same tempo. And finally, we also offer an alternative approach to the analysis of spatial diffusion that does not assume that regions play the same role all along. Some regions might start leading the process, but at later stages, they might in fact start following other regions. And this is something that you can only see when you track changes over time. Um, all right, now there's obviously many more questions that we did not consider in this paper um, and that we would like to consider in the future. For instance, it would be interesting to analyze the properties of those networks of influence and see if we can identify, say, structural hubs. It would also be interesting to um, identify the factors that shape the influence pathways that we map. So we map those pathways, but we don't explain them. And it would also be interesting to see if this same method could be applied to different partitions, not geographical, but say demographic. And although this is contingent to the existence of appropriate data, and we haven't been able to find appropriate data to test this idea. Um, OK, so we feel that we learned something interesting about the dynamics of the centralized communication. But there was also this other question on the background of our work that we didn't manage to answer. And again, we didn't intend to answer the question. We knew it would be very difficult to, to, to give an answer to that. But we still think it would be nice if we could. And that is the question of whether we can use measures of coordination in distributed communication to anticipate the emergence of collective action. And so essentially, this would imply shifting metaphors of opinions as thermostats that are adjusted when the temperature changes to the analogy of early warning systems um, that is common in disaster prevention. And obviously, the goal here would not be to prevent people from organizing a protest, which is a legitimate goal, but to be able to strengthen the accountability loop between citizens with their preferences and their demands and their representatives. Uh, because in the end, strengthening that loop is what democracy is all about. Um, polls and surveys have been the main tools to monitor what the public wants and feed that information back to decision making and to policy debates. And we think that social media might offer another channel to enforce that accountability loop and identify changes in collective attention and ultimately opinion formation. But again, finding a way to do that is not trivial, although I'm pretty sure that it's not more difficult than building the self-driving car that uh, which Duncan was talking about this morning. And what I just showed you is a first step, is an example of how we started to think about the methods that might help us advance in that direction. But there's a lot of work to be done still. And yet there's still one more question that remains, and that is, did we really need six physicists and one sociologist to write this paper? I don't know, um, but what I do know is that the research that resulted from this collaboration was better than it would have been had we worked on our own, even though this implied for some of us to be pushed outside of our comfort zones, like pretty far. Um, but from my perspective, I think I really gained insights about social change and the dynamics, the temporal dynamics of which sociologists haven't really thought too much about. So, um, yes, there are still many open questions on the table. But looking back, I think it's pretty obvious that digital technologies and social media in particular have allowed us to move faster in the last few years than in the previous century of collective behavior research. And so I think Todd would be very happy with the progress made since he wrote about those statistics of conversation that he wanted to compile. I don't think we have managed to come up with better metaphors than those that he and his contemporaries used. But we have managed to unpack some of those metaphors and get a better sense of the forces that drive collective behavior and by extension so, uh, social change. And so 
We now know that time and scale matter. Uh, the dripping of information through uh, networks is not constant, but instead it responds to correlations in our communication activities that get amplified in non-intuitive ways. And so that's why the analysis of large-scale coordination and synchronization is important to understand collective behavior. We also know that there are many sources of complexity in networks for which we need new metrics, and uh, we also need to come up with alternative ways of summarizing large-scale network data. The usual metrics that we social scientists have been using for decades are not enough anymore. And also we have come to realize that we need to reformulate the individual level mechanisms used in theoretical models of social influence and contagion, as some of the talks this morning also mentioned, uh, essentially to make them more attuned to what we observe in empirical data. For instance, these temporal correlations that are of which I just um, talked on, on the aggregate level. And I'm finishing up. Um, more generally, one thing that history tells us is that for good ideas to thrive, you need to support the support of institutions, but also that the boundaries those institutions impose on knowledge often constrain innovation and fresh thinking, right? The social sciences had a hard time finding a space in the university system. Those in charge of its governance were for a long time reluctant to embrace an emergent discipline. And many teaching and research institutions were created to fill that intellectual space. And since I'm staying at the Women's Faculty Club, I feel sort of obliged to mention that women also played a crucial role in that process. I wish there were more books written about them. And so key players include Jen Whale in France and Beatrice Webb in England, who contributed to the foundation of LSC, the London School of Economics. And um, they were central in the fundraising efforts that made those institutions possible and ultimately allowed the consolidation of the field. And I think that what we now call computational social science, for lack of a better term, might also be in a similar position in the sense that it still, it still needs to break free from traditional ways of organizing knowledge, uh, but it also needs to institutionalize so that some systematic progress can be made. And with this, I'm done. <laughs>